There are ITV regions and companies that are obvious, that come to mind instantly. Thames, of course. Granada, all but inescapable. ATV, legendary. And then there are the ones where maybe you need a prompt. TVS, HTV, maybe even Yorkshire. And then there's the ones that quietly get on with things in their corner of the country and quite often don't come to mind at all if you don't make a concerted effort. Like Border, or TSW, or Anglia, the major minor. And now, from Norwich. East Anglia, land of mustard and broads, a place so flat it often seems as though God, or slightly about fast maybe, whacked it repeatedly with a state tenderizer before finishing it off. The bizarre mirror universe of the southwest. One minute to zero. This is Anglia Television. The logically named Anglia Television got its start in 1959. East Anglia's own personal brown rig was Aubrey Buxton, a bona fide war hero and naturalist who would guide Anglia for nearly its first 30 years. Buxton was a traditional straight-backed soldier type at heart, albeit a surprisingly sensitive one, what with his love of alive animals over dead ones, a predilection which would come to have a lasting impact on both Anglia and ITV itself, but we'll come back to that later. As befits a station run by an ex-military man, Anglia's initial and most enduring identity was heraldic, dignified and regal. The jingle wasn't by Steve Race or even Wally Stott. It was by Jörg Friedrich Handel. And the symbol was a gallant knight. At least I assume he was gallant. They made a sterling silver statue out of him. Yes, it goes on a bit, but there is something genuinely powerful about this initial version of the Anglian Knight, with the moody and carefully timed lighting representing perhaps the closest the art of the British ident ever got to German Expressionism. Anglia may not have been a major player in the ITV network, but this makes it clear that if you caught them anyone's bitch, you would wind up with a lance sticking out of your jacksy. And while they may not have had the clout of the Big Four, that Anglia Knight still got a decent run out on the national screens. They quickly picked up a reputation for their contribution to the ITV Play of the Week strand, which were good enough to give the BBC cause to tuck at its collar and make that <coughs> noise. Sadly, this being the 50s and early 60s, I'm pretty sure most of the Anglia Plays of the Week were wiped, which is why you're currently looking at a David Niven film that provided the basis for one of the earlier ones, Carrington VC. Anglia's first three plays inside the first year of operation shot into the top ten, which was both astonishing and irritating for the big four, who felt that they were making quite enough programming for the whole network by themselves, thank you, and didn't much like being shoved out of the limelight by these rural upstarts with a comedy accent. Eventually, Anglia struck a deal with Rediffusion. The latter would make space on the network for their contributions to the play of the week, on the condition that said contributions were made in London with Rediffusion staff. A potentially even more important contribution to the network came in 1961, when Anglia launched its most enduring show, Survival. Survival was the brainchild of Aubrey Buxton himself. In the same year, he co-founded the WWF. Yes, very good, you know which one I meant. Survival was to become ITV's flagship nature documentary, 
back in the days when nature documentaries were things you could see on a regular basis on British television, rather than things which only appeared when David Attenborough had something new to talk about. A situation that is getting rarer all the time. Survival was again initially distributed by rediffusion with conditions. In this case, the condition was that the first episode had to be about wildlife in London. This was actually quite a good idea because it literally brought zoology home. And Buxton readily agreed to do an hour-long programme in which he rode around in a Bentley, delightedly pointing at feral pigeons and urban foxes. Again, it was a massive success and soon survival was being networked all over. And I mean all over. It was the most successful British programme in history in terms of international sales. The first British show sold to China, and ultimately the first show anywhere to be sold to literally every single country on the planet with a television industry. Not bad for the little guys. Colour had arrived in East Anglia by 1969 and was an inescapable fact of life by the early 70s. This obviously meant the night had to be reshot, and what Anglia ended up with proved to be one of the most famous, not to say infamous, idents in UK history, largely because of the version from the start-up sequence. If the original version went on a bit, this one was interminable, and seemed to mislay all the best things about the original Night Ident, which is to say the mood, and the lighting, and the drama. The black and white version of Sir Anglia was moodily backlit in stages, whereas the colour version had very even lighting that just kind of flattened the statue out visually, and made the sterling silver look more like pewter. On top of that, the camera work is visibly worse, the original had the statue standing motionless, because it's a statue, yeah, while the camera tracked and panned around it. This time, they just stuck it on a turntable, while a dead-eyed camera just gawps at it, turning around and around and around for almost a full minute. And just to make it complete, they chose an arrangement of the water music which goes to extreme lengths to not reach the ending. Nothing this awesome looking should also be this dull. And it's been seen on nostalgia shows and Room 101 ever since as an excuse to point and laugh at the idiots from the past. But that isn't quite fair. The suggestion on all of those point and chortle shows was that this was the main ident. That every time Anglia were introducing a show they'd play all 50 seconds of paradoxically inert motion. But as I said, this was just a version from the start-up sequence. Generally, to introduce such as Coronation Street or World in Action, Agley would go with something less psychotic, like this. <laughs> Or if it was a show they'd made themselves, this. Or they just used Envision continuity like everyone else, except Yorkshire. Anglia's faces were a varied lot, from the Valerie Sinatra-like Sharon Gray, who one suspects featured heavily in many a Norfolk boy's adolescence, to the slightly lumpy Patrick Anthony with the face of a farmer and the voice of some sort of aristocrat. And we have the girl in the £5,000 platinum bikini. All that to come... He's actually Irish. Not that you can tell from the voice. For some reason, Anglia's announcers had to introduce programming from inside a photo booth at the local post office. But they never seemed to mind.
They even had their own equivalent of Gus Honeybun in the slightly moth-eaten shape of B.C., named after the slot, Birthday Club, or possibly Big Cat, because I think that's what he is. Unlike Gus, he couldn't do magic or wink, but he did wave at the kids. So there's that. Dave, and also at Stephen, would you? <laughs> what are you laughing at? And so Anglia pottered along throughout the 70s, an occasional presence on the national network and a faithful servant to the East, until a spanner was thrown into the works in 1974. You'll recall, assuming you've been paying attention from the Yorkshire episode, that there was a massive pointless argument over who owned the Blisdale transmitter, positioned right on the border between Yorkshire and Tyne Tees. Part of the solution involved merging them together so they'd shut up about it once and for all, but another part involved taking the Belmont transmitter, located in Lincolnshire and owned by Anglia, and giving it to Yorkshire as a peace offering, with the side effect that the blameless Anglia would lose over a million viewers. Anglia protested, of course, but the IBA's response was basically, well, that's little man. And within a year, Anglia's profits had been halved. This may have turned out to be something of a blessing in disguise, however, albeit a very good disguise, as they'd been attracting criticism of late from the IBA and the unions for what they perceived as increasing complacency at the company. Regional programming was reportedly down to just five hours a week, most of that news. Having a good chunk of their viewership arbitrarily amputated woke Anglia from its slumber, and realising that specifically regional television could mean targeted advertising, and that could mean increased profit, they successfully turned it around, avoiding the wrath of the IBA, which could have cost them the franchise in 1981. Eventually, they were back in the black, aided by their second great national success, Sale of the Century. And now, from Norwich, it's the Quiz of the Week. The Win Some Tat Quiz of the Week, hosted by a faintly satanic Nicholas Parsons. Elizabeth, have you got a mink coat? No. Would you like to earn a mink coat, Elizabeth? Would you like to earn a mink coat, Elizabeth? Come on, say, would you like to earn a mink coat? <laughs> and so time crept at its petty pace from day to day. The 1980 franchise round came and went with only a very slight wobble against a consortium based in Cambridge. Until suddenly, it was the late 80s. And Anglia's ident was still a shot of a statue accompanied by classical music. In aesthetic terms, by 1987, the Anglia ident fit in with its era about as well as a human kidney in a box of Christmas decorations. It looked like the sort of thing that might play before a British film from the 60s, not the brand identity of a contemporary TV station. With Anglia in serious danger of turning into your granddad's channel in the public consciousness, the time had clearly come for some serious rebranding. As Aubrey Buxton finally retired to a life of nature preserves with his new wife, his television company hired the already legendary Martin Lambie Nairn and his company and charged them with the task of remaking Anglia Television. Whereupon Lambie Nairn charged Anglia Television half a million quid. New logo, new music, new ident, new Anglia. It's a lovely ident, if a little sombre. Terrific and almost impressionistic animation, too. Notice how the symbol and the flag sort of alternate with each other before finally forming up together at the end. That truly is very boring to talk about, but it's a great effect anyway. In a sea of 3D objects flying through space... The originators of the trend come along and do something completely different, but just as good. Definitely worth that £500,000. They even managed to trade up their IVC to some nice virtual studios like everyone else in the network, as demonstrated here by Paul Labors, sort of Ian Sterling reimagined as a camp stand-up comedian. Well, B.A., you shouldn't have started yet. Now, I've had my first mince pie tonight. 
They got the scars to prove it. Now, hands up, all of you... Understandably, having only just introduced such an awesome ident and spent half a million on it to boot, Anglia were less than enthusiastic about the ITV generic look that came along just a year later. And in common with TSW, Granada and TVS, turned it down flat. This is what they could have won. It almost works, what with the new symbol being heavily triangle based in itself, but then it veers off and ultimately doesn't. God alone knows what they might have ended up with if they hadn't introduced a new symbol by then. Actually, the knight might have been easier to work in than a lot of things. Even the Broadcasting Act 1990 couldn't dampen Anglia's spirits, at least not at first. East Anglia being a small rural area without a tendency towards spreading huge amounts of cash, they were largely uncontested in the 1991 auction, and they won the franchise back without breaking stride. Actually, if anything, they probably overbid. They ended up with a stipend of 17.8 million a year. They probably could have got away with a lot less than that. And maybe then they would have been less vulnerable to an inevitable takeover bid, once the Traps were opened in 1994. MAI, the owners of Meridian, snapped Anglia up within minutes of the new rules coming into effect, and after merging with UNM soon added HTV to their quiver, as was recounted in the South episode. As you'll recall, if you've been paying attention, they then tried to merge with Carlton, failed at the last moment, and left ITV altogether, leaving Granada to pick up the scraps, which included... Anglia. So it was that in the very year they celebrated their 40th anniversary by getting the night out of mothballs, Anglia started down the road that led to the inevitable loss of their individuality, as their new owners unveiled their new look for the entire network. And this time, no one could argue because everyone was the subsidiary, except the ones who were subsidiaries of Carlton. What Anglia needed, what they all needed, was a gallant knight riding to the rescue. But sadly, he was just a statue all along. And after 20 odd years of constant endless revolving, far too dizzy to be of any use to anyone anyway. Would you like to run a week, Count Elizabeth?